Good day, this is Gary Kavna with GRIPT. I am here today with Professor Brian Fanning. He is a Professor of Migration and Social Policy at UCD and the author of the newly published book, Public Morality and the Culture Wars, The Triple Divide. Uh, Brian and I will be going through the book today. Brian, it's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you very much for having me. So just to start with Brian, the book looks at various issues of the culture war trying to position where each side is on it to the extent that there are two sides and kind of where the middle ground is. The history of it, sometimes going back quite substantially, there's a lot of talk about early Christian philosophy and, and, and uh, some pre-Christian philosophy as well. And trying to give what is, in my, uh, in my view, a very kind of fair view of the differences that people have on these issues. So I suppose just to start with, could you walk us through why it was that you decided to publish this book, what its objective is, what you felt it could add to the existing literature, and why this is the time for a book like this. Okay, there are a number of reasons why this book now. First of all, is I do have an academic interest in the, on the concept of public morality, which is the idea that law can be used to enforce morals. So in other words, we enforce our preferred recipe for the good society through the laws we have. And as social values change, perhaps thinking about that changes too. So uh, two of the main writers in relation to that were an English philosopher slash jurist, eh, Herbert Hart, who in the 1960s wrote about the decriminalization of homosexuality in Britain. And Hart's big idea was that homosexuality was decriminalized at a time in Britain when the underlying attitudes towards homosexuality had not changed. So changing the law of itself was did not make a substantial change until societal attitudes caught up with it. In other words, there was a gap between what the law said and societal prejudices towards people. Um, so one of the things Hart looked at how, was how basically, even after homosexuality came to be decriminalized in the United Kingdom, that discrimination against you know, gay people persisted and that other laws were, if you will, pressed into use for purpose they hadn't been designed for to basically uh, persecute gay people. And he was thinking in particular about the offense of the corruption of public morals, which is something that dates back to Cromwell's time and has got to do with espionage and treason. But the idea that basically, if you will, people expressing affection towards each other in public was corrupting public morals was an interpretation of the law that came up at a time when homosexuality had been decriminalized in Britain. So there can be a gap between social attitudes and what the law is. Uh, and at times there can be efforts to catch up with. So sometimes the law can be at a vanguard position and at other times basically the law can lag behind societal attitudes and perhaps needs to change. Hart's idea as an academic was basically the law at the end of the day doesn't necessarily draw on kind of, uh, if you will, absolute truth, but more on social beliefs and social attitudes and the, that the law basically represents a sort of a, a moving average of, of values in society. The second person who got me interested in this was an Irish uh, conservative philosopher uh, and sociologist and, and, and priest, uh, Jeremiah Newman, who at one stage was the Bishop of Limerick in the 80s. From the 1960s onwards, however, he was one of Ireland's better sociologists and he had many different strings to his bow, but one of them was writing about public morality. And he wrote a book basically asking why is it okay for to have a public morality that would push Catholic ideas in an Irish context and for Catholics in America to, to say, as like John F. Kennedy would have said at the time, that you know, we were not going to push Catholic ideas on people through law if, if, if basically, um, if, if say Kennedy won. And this was one of the big sort of anti-Catholic arguments at the time, that if Catholics got into power, they would basically bring in Catholic laws uh, and so on that would be unpopular with others, such as around divorce. Now, Newman wrote about the idea of public morality, and he kind of hit on something that was really interesting to me that many other writers on the topics have since done, was that Newman was very clear about this, that in Ireland, which was a majority Catholic country, uh, the, the state was perfectly right to have laws that reflected Catholic values, including prohibitions on divorce, abortion, and so on. But in societies like America, where Catholics were at a minority, the church and the interests of Catholics and the faith was best protected not by 
an insistence on forcing a religious public morality, but basically by cleaving to liberalism, in other words, the freedom to express one's ideas. So in other words, this is quite a real politic thing. It, it, you know, if, 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 you dom if your values dominate, you, you, you tend to believe, well, OK, it's a good idea to basically build these into the law. But if your values are now minority values, uh, whether you're religious or secular, you start looking to the liberals for support. Another way of thinking about this is how in certain parts of the United States, say, going back a century ago uh, and elsewhere since, that liberals, in other words, people who are mostly keen on free speech and progressives were often in alliance with, with one another against conservative majorities, conservative governments, conservative values. In other words, they wanted free speech, they wanted individual rights and so on and so forth, such as the ACLU in America and so on and so forth. But what we now see in the 21st century is that the, the battle lines have been withdrawn, that liberals are perhaps more likely to side with conservatives who are a minority in certain contexts against progressives who are now seen to, if you will, dominate uh, political political uh, 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 life uh, to basically kind of ask for, if you will, or to try and basically cleave towards free speech and so on. So free speech is something you cleave to if you're a minority, but if you're in, a, if your viewpoint is in a majority or in ascendancy, you, you, uh, people are often less interested in that and are more complacent about that. So Catholics have often been very much in the camp of free speech. In Germany, during the culture camp in the late 19th century, there were alliances with the Liberal Party, uh, at the, before Catholic emancipation, when Catholics were oppressed, you know, Daniel O'Connell was basically, if you will, very much in alliance with the liberals uh, and so on and so forth. And Catholics in America were very clear that they were advocates of, of free speech and democracy, uh, because that would best protect their position as a religious minority in the United States. So the idea of public morality is a layered one. At one level, it, it's kind of uh, conflicts around basically what sort of values should be represented in the law. But behind that, then, there is basically the bigger arguments about bigger kinds of values, uh, value sets, those associated with religious conservatism, those associated with liberal individualism, and those are what we would be kind of loosely called progressive at the moment, you know, which, which have, all have their different priorities. But it's, it's kind of like, a, it's, 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 like it's, it's not a conflict with two sides, as in liberals versus conservatives, because when Americans use the term liberals, they tend to mean social liberals as well as free speech people. Whereas in, in, in certainly in, in, in other parts of the Anglophone world, a liberal is somebody perhaps who's more free market or individualist or, or in, in, in the key of say a John Stuart Mill. Whereas a progressive is somebody who perhaps is more in the key of a, a Rousseau or a Foucault who, who has, you know, has ideas about social transformation uh, that go beyond individual rights. So it's quite a complicated vista in a sense, but the idea of the book, the idea of the title is this triple divide. And I wanted to understand this a bit better. I also coming from another angle is I write a lot about migration and uh, you know, Ireland's become a much more diverse society. Uh, and, and, and certainly that's been you know, something I've looked at very, uh, very much in a previous book, the Diverse Republic. I looked at basically Ireland's mostly pro-migration consensus but also in a sense that certain people felt left behind. Uh, and, and the question I asked myself in that book is to what extent, you know, kind of certain people, minorities, people who are perhaps, uh, you know, more conservative than the norm, people perhaps who are uneasy about migration and so on, you know, how that might find expression in Ireland. Uh, we've seen versions of this, of course, in, in terms of populist movements in other, in other democratic countries, but we haven't seen this in Ireland. So I was kind of also trying to understand this. Uh, and I guess the third part of the plank is that certainly within academia, there is a concern at the moment that uh, we, need to we need to be concerned about viewpoint diversity. And there's a movement in the United States uh, called the Heterodox Academy uh, that's very preoccupied with this. In other words, university education needs to be able to prepare people for the very complex worlds they find themselves in. And it can't do so unless basically it, 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 academic freedom and so on and teaching allows for the expression of, of viewpoint diversity. In other words, different ways of thinking about and understanding the world. Um, and, and coming back to the liberal in me kind of says that unless we're able to express our ideas and test our ideas, we don't make good decisions as a society. Uh, we, that, that, that those would be the sorts of different sorts of uh, kind of, if you will, things that fed into my decision to try and write this particular book at this time. A long fascination with the idea of public morality, uh, 
uh, an interest in social change, uh, and then perhaps a sense that also, uh, you know, certain issues were coming to the fore where I felt some of these ideas might be useful in helping us think about concrete issues. Uh, not necessarily ones that just affect Ireland, but ones that affect the Anglophone world. In other words, English speaking countries that have common law jurisdictions. One of the, the things you touched on, it seems to, it, it's repeated kind of commonly throughout the book, is that there, there appears to be nearly a cyclical nature to the support for free speech. People in weakened positions support it, they gain power, and then reasons are found why free speech is not uh, something to be supported anymore. I'm just curious, do you think that that is? effectively most sides in this debate when they get into a position of power are going to find reasons to curtail speech that really it doesn't matter who wins the same thing is going to replicate again itself again and again there are other things that are taking place that are quite interesting and at the back of it all i'm a sociologist so i kind of want to understand what's going on as best i can and the, the when we think about free speech uh you know, in terms of the liberal tradition, which would inform, say, for example, interpretation of the American Constitution in the 20th century, one of the great uh, kind of judges who basically ruled on this in the early 20th century was um, Oliver Wendell Holmes. And Wendell Holmes kind of expressed it like this. He said, free speech, absolutely, but no shouting fire in a crowded theatre. In other words, if your free speech has harmful consequences for others, demonstrably harmful consequences for others, then there's a kind of a societal case for putting some curbs on that. But if that, if that can't be found, if that, if, that, if that risk can't be found, then your free speech rights should be paramount. Now, what we've seen in perhaps if, quite recently is a very, is, is, are now different ways of talking about harm. Harm, not just in terms of perhaps the fear of violence or the incitement to hatred that leads to actual violence against people, but subjectively understood senses of harm, as in I feel harmed, or I, 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 I whereas we much more focused on individual feelings. Um, and, 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 and that's understandable sociologically, I think, because we live in a world that's very different than one of previous generations. Anybody who even spends a little time on Twitter or on social media can get very burnt out by being constantly assailed with material that basically really, really gets into their head and reaches into them at times and can find it quite upsetting or distressing or whatever. So in other words, the world encroaches upon us in a way that it didn't. It comes into our bedrooms, it comes into our laptops and so on and so forth. So, so be, it, it's almost in a situation that we're in each other's faces a lot more than we were. And there's a certain amount of rejigging that needs to take place at this moment in time to make sense of that in order for things to work. But beyond that, there's also a sense of, of an understanding of harm that's hugely different from the sort of traditional ideas of harm uh, that, 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 and ways of talking about harm that would have been there. So the Incitement to Hatred Act in Ireland, for example, the one from the 80s, you know, never worked as a piece of legislation because you had to demonstrate that I said something that incited you or somebody else to basically conduct an act then that physically harmed somebody that was racist. So, so, so in a sense, basically, the burden of proof was, was very high indeed. The threshold was very high indeed. We're now in a place where perhaps there, there's a very different balance being struck, or at least conversations about what that balance should be. Uh, and the terms of the conversation are being trashed out all the time. But within that, broadly speaking, within society, there are ways of talking about harm that, that, are, that are very expansive indeed. Uh, um, so, so they may have consequences for free speech. And I think people are legitimately concerned about some of those. So you brought up Wendell Holmes there, and, and I think probably his most famous ruling about fire in a theatre. But I do think it's worth pointing out exactly what he was referring to in that case in the Schenk, I think. Schenk yes, 1919 Schenk. Adams, no. actually. Adams or Schenk. I can't remember which one it was. 1919, anyway. I think it demonstrates kind of the danger of metaphor as well, that in that case, what had been happening is that someone had been giving out leaflets during World War I, arguing against the draft. Yes. And that that became, uh, you know, fight, shouting fire in a theatre. And then, of course, it, that was kind of uh, jigged around in Brandenburg, where it became imminent risk of harm because it was felt that that was actually quite broad. Um, and I think it's worth mentioning just because... It, it's one of those things people bring up and sounds very reasonable, but metaphors can kind of get away from us quite easily. 
and you end up covering things that you didn't expect. And I think actually that's kind of the fear with the hate speech bill as well, that a lot of it sounds good, but where are the lines for where are the limits? What's actually going to be covered here? Yeah, I mean, I'm not an expert on on the law, uh, but my sense of it is, is that some legitimate concerns have been expressed about some aspects of the hate speech, mostly due to the lack of precision of some of the terminology, for example, what constitutes hate and so on. So so kind of, if you will, that's all I'd have to say about that, really. And I think that the more we debate that and the more openly we debate that before making law, the better it will be for us and the better law we will make. Uh, so quite clearly, a balance of some sort has to be struck. But I think uh, the conversation does seem to have been shut down prematurely in, in, in this particular one. And it's quite interesting that the, there's a whole range of voices now expressing you know, some very reasonable, some very sensible, some very well informed people uh, kind of raising some concerns about this particular issue at the moment. I wanted to touch on the point you made about immigration there, about communities that feel that they're left behind, and also some of what you quote from uh, Hart in the book. You quote Hart talking about how laws are a system of man-made rules, that judges and juries can't help but be influenced by that, and that legitimacy of the law is rooted in public acceptance. And one of the things we know, particularly on the ground, when we go into communities to talk about immigration, is there is a feeling that they are not being treated with respect, that they are not dealing on a, a fair plane with people. And some of those people, and some of I think well, the problems that we're seeing with people and lack of trust in media and in government and reduced legitimacy, I think because of that, is because these people feel that politicians, judges, the systems in place, the, the, the sort of infrastructure of the state does not represent their views uh, and is not sort of organic. And I think in the book, when we're talking about how societies evolve, there is nearly a sense that the, there is a balance between these forces and things are broadly representative. But I know when I talk to people of more conservative bent, and particularly in this issue where we've sent uh, reporters in to talk to people beside direct provision centers who weren't informed they were going to be opening and are now dealing with um, certain issues because of it, that there is not a feeling that this was done fairly, that it, it does not represent their views. That and It is a topic, I think, of debate, particularly amongst more conservative people in Ireland of, well, if you have socially conservative uh, views, who do you vote for? Because none of the major parties represent those views. Um, it was actually recently I was a talk and a Polish MEP was speaking. And he was talking about people saying that Poland was becoming uh, an authoritarian state and it, that it was becoming undemocratic in certain aspects. And his response to say was that in Poland, you can vote for anyone you want and there is reputation from the communist party to the hard right. So how can it be undemocratic if the people choose a hard right option? And he basically put it that in many of the Western European countries, the democratic uh, mandate is actually substantially smaller because it is less representative of what the public want. And I just wonder, do you have a thought on that, on, on basically the idea that while there is an ongoing debate, some of the apparatus of the state, some of the institutions has taken views that do not represent the public. And that is leading to a feeling that there is not, there is a reduced level of legitimacy because people do not feel those institutions represent them. Okay, so there's an awful lot in what you've just said there, as in you've covered a very large amount of ground very quickly. Uh, so I'll pick up on some aspects or elements of this. First of all, um, not everybody agrees on everything. Uh, and certainly there is now uh, perhaps a minority in Ireland, those people who voted um, kind of against removing the eighth, in other words, who, who basically would be kind of anti-abortion a very small proportion who perhaps would not be terribly happy with us in the European Union, uh, quite a lot of other people who might be disgruntled or feel left out or left behind in many other ways. And to some extent, these groups may well overlap. So they're, they're, the idea that the, if you will, as a significant portion of Irish people are left out of the prevailing consensus and that they have nobody to vote for uh, is, 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 is perhaps an idea to be floated. Uh, I would, of course, they have people to vote for. 
uh, they, they can vote in every election. They can vote in local government elections. But it's probably more the case that the mainstream political parties have moved on and are not necessarily seeking to appeal to them anymore. Now, which brings us to another thing really here, the issue of respect. I'm big on respect. And one of the reasons I'm kind of speaking you know, here, which is basically a, a very distinctly conservative platform, uh, is I'd be very happy also to speak to very progressive platforms and liberal platforms as well, because you know, my, my, my point is, I guess, that we, we do need to basically have space for viewpoint diversity, expressing diversity of viewpoints in society. Uh, if you seek to shut down certain viewpoints that are reasonable or legitimate in certain ways, if you treat people with disrespect, uh, you, you end up with consequences you don't want. So, I, I, you know, I'm, my kind of broad message when I'm speaking to colleagues who perhaps, you know, would 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 identify much more as progressives perhaps on all of the issues perhaps that relate here is that you should really break bread with and talk to people who you disagree with rather than and I would say the same thing to anybody out there most stuff on social media most writing most polemics most opinion pieces are pretty much aimed at people who already agree with you the challenge is to try and understand and engage with people who hold different points of view so there is an argument for engaging with others. And there's a, certainly a very, very strong argument about not having people feel like they are treated with disrespect. Now, there are many, re there are many points of view you could take in migration. Uh, some people may regard basically open borders as a good thing or as the, the wise thing. Other people may say, I am broadly against immigration. I, 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 it's not something I like. Uh, others like me perhaps would sort of say is that once people here, they are really part of the same society. So we all benefit by basically making things work well together and we need to plan for success rather than failure. So there's an argument to be very inclusive once people are here. But when it comes to the kinds of issues you're talking about, it's not just one voice of conservative people. There are, there are groups out there who are essentially very small numbers of actors who are disruptive. There are people, disruptors, sorry. There are people as well, perhaps, who are very, very, very legitimately concerned about thinking uh, about issues that are happening in their community. And in particular, they are concerned about the lack of support coming from the state, perhaps the lack of clarity, to some extent, the lack of consultation, uh, the, 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 which can also boil down to a feeling that the state just doesn't have the capacity to properly support people in their area and to support communities that are seen or see themselves as taking on an additional burden. And so there's a lot of space, a lot of work that needs to be done to basically build for legitimacy, to build for success in terms of community development. And there is a real shortfall perhaps here. We've seen it with a number of cases in Ireland already. So in that context, uh, you know, th there are protests, there are disagreements and so on. Yet at the same time, there is also you know, kind of a fairly broad support in Ireland for what I would call our emerging diverse republic. In other words, people are not just Irish by ancestry, but also kind of from recent migrants, recent, you know, migrants for the last 20, 30 years or whatever, uh, their children, my students who have grown up in places like Blanchardstown and so on, who are as Irish as I am, and so on. So we have a diverse society. We have rapid change. We have a lot of refugees coming in. We have real issues of state capacity. People can legitimately have grievances and issues with what goes on. And we have as a, as a society, we have to have the confidence to be able to manage all of that. And the job of the state, of course, is to basically is, 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 is to basically manage things effectively and well and to demonstrate that it can solve the problems that people are worried about. So all of these things kind of feed into a cocktail. So I, I, my point of view is basically that we, we perhaps need more conversation and more debate and perhaps at times a little less kind of hectoring and perhaps at times also a little less calling people out as racists or fascists just because they have a viewpoint you disagree with a bit. So, so kind of in, 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 in a sense, in a sense, in a sense, basically, we, we, there's much we could do better here in this society. There's much that the state could do better. Uh, at the same time, really, the argument is, is that we will solve these problems over time and that these concerns about the large numbers of asylum seekers abate after a period of time, that communities do indeed uh, do an awful lot of work to help and support people, that most people end up very quickly to be in a position where they're making real contributions to our society, and that in the longer term, it's in our interest for it all to be successful rather than some kind of disaster. So yeah, there are a lot of issues here. Um, and, and you know, it's quite legitimate for people to have different points of view on these would be my view.
So, so to move on from immigration, I mean, there's obviously a, a ton, particularly given your speciality, that we could talk about on this. But I want to try and, and keep yeah. fairly close to what's touched on in the book. And, and immigration, interestingly enough, uh, isn't really, which I suppose leads me to, to my next question. You go through kind of uh, free speech, intolerance, uh, abortion, uh, the idea of civil religions. You go through a couple of different topics where there is legitimate debate here. Um, how did you choose what should be included in the book? How did you determine that these were kind of the core areas that you wanted to discuss with people? Um, I guess I was kind of, um, okay, just take a step back. Um, I guess I've just been thinking about these issues for quite some time. As somebody who has worked and lived in Ireland uh, for the last uh, 20 years, well, the last 20 years living in Ireland, then before that abroad, and then before that growing up in Ireland, uh, certainly kind of the, the abortion issue has been a, a very significant issue in, in Irish society. And uh, what we've seen, you know, with, with referenda and so on, you know, our views changing, majority views changing over time on this. Uh, certainly in the United States also, the abortion issue, especially since... Uh, since Roe versus Way during the 70s, uh, you begin to see basically politics being polarized around this issue to quite an extent. And there was a certain kind of revival within, within, the, within the, you know, kind of uh, Republican Party that would be kind of increasingly pro-life uh, and, 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 and liberals and the Democrats being associated with pro-choice to a greater extent. So kind of th that's an obvious example to have. Um, I, have a other, I have a chapter on, on prohibition and on, on movie censorship. And I use that chapter in particular to talk about how, uh, how basically Catholicism basically found a space to be an agent of public morality in terms of the cinema in the United States and how Catholic positions and Protestant positions were, were very different when it came to the prohibition of alcohol. So even within, uh, if you were Christianity, there are actually quite different positions struck on, on a range of issues. Uh, and of course, I've looked at more contemporary issues as well uh, in relation to, to, to sex and gender. Um, I, I guess what I was, I'm looking for really were the sort of, well, look, a book like this kind of works. It's, 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 not, a, it's not a panacea. It's not a cure-all. It's a certain account or thread of things, mostly focused on the idea of public morality. And public morality is mostly debated are really you know, within the law, as in basically that's where, if you will, certain meanings uh, and, and decisions are struck. So basically that certainly was part of it as well. But to understand all of this, I felt I had to take a step back as well, which was to understand the big ideas that inform ways of thinking about morality, uh, to thinking about the human person, which would be very different, say, for uh, a Catholic or a devout Christian uh, than it would be perhaps for somebody who's secular. For example, do you have an immortal soul or not? There are Christian ideas of personalism. There are viewpoints that basically and of, of, of life before birth and so on. Uh, there are ideas of sin. And one of the big ideas I kind of begin with is the idea of original sin. Uh, and, and, and then moving away from that very sort of Christian idea of the human being as flawed, which is the idea of original sin, uh, to the idea of, say, the sort of post-enlightenment idea that we're all these we're pure children of neat nature where we have the opportunity and hopefully the potential to flourish and we are corrupted by the outside world rather than by our own tendencies as humans to be flawed and imperfect. So the big philosophies, if you will, behind Christianity and behind post enlightenment secular thought uh, and some other ideas as well that have hugely influenced uh, ways of thinking about what it is to be human in the, in, in, in the sort of democratic West in, in recent decades, where are sort of a backdrop to this as well. Uh, so in other words, basically, what are, we, what are we arguing about? We're arguing about viewpoints on certain issues. Where do these viewpoints come from? They come from profound or deeply held ideas of what it is to be human from a number of different perspectives. Uh, and in the West, they tend to begin, this, this story tends to begin with Christianity one way or another, uh, which begets the idea of an individual responsible for themselves, if, if for to God, perhaps. Uh, but then the idea of individualism as it becomes secularized uh, and so on and so on. So there is this backdrop of ideas that I, I felt was worth looking at at the beginning of the book to place some of this more recent kind of uh, these recent debates in, in, in context. So there are differences of values and sometimes the differences of values that we find are ones between near neighbors. So Christians, you know, who all believed in the ostensibly the same, the same things, 
kind of there was a reformation. There was a schism between between first of all between Catholics and 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 and, and Protestants, and then kind of many different uh, versions of Protestantism. There have been wars fought between Christians for centuries about, uh, you know, for a combination of reasons. And we, we don't see that quite so much now. Uh, but, and then the big debates then became ones between people who are religious and ones who are secular. And now we're, we're in an era where perhaps we're dealing with the differences between humanism and post-humanism in a sense. The, the ideas about who we think we are, what we think is important, these matter to us and whether we know we have them or not, whether we've read the books or not, we, we certainly imbibe these ideas in our culture. Something I just wanted to ask from, from reading the book, in kind of the more conservative circles that I would move in, people tend to uh, agree with Thomas Sowell's ideas in A Conflict of Vision, where he basically says there, there are two views of human nature, constrained or unconstrained, which can roughly be described as uh, you know, man after the fall and Rousseauian. Basically, yeah. man is flawed and unperfectible, and man is perfectible. Now, a lot of the people I would associate with, with would view a lot of what is happening in modern society as effectively a, a religious issue, and not just a civil religion, but effectively having all of the trappings of a religion based on a belief in the perfectibility of man, that if we teach children a certain way, we will remove certain, uh, you know, we will end hate, we will end anger, we will end all of these things. And I just wonder, I know in the book you talk about um, Mills, and Mills fear that we would move into a um, coercive public morality of civil religion. I think that is the great fear on the kind of conservative side of things, that when we see things like um, you know, pride flags and things being hung up in places, I think the conservative side a lot of their negative reaction to that is not because of any concern about LGBT rights as such. It's because they view it as an expression of a coercive religion. And I know this is something that you discuss in the book, different, not that I don't describe aspect, it as a coercive religion. No, no, no. I, I'm not saying that you did, but Nothing you talk like about the idea of uh, a civil religion and Mill's fear of um, a coercive civil religion. A civil so, religion is, is kind of, in, is another idea from Rousseau. Rousseau is a bit of a genius. At one level, he kind of is identified as the intellectual architect of uh, kind of the sort of therapeutic individualisms of the modern age. At another level, basically, he's a great documenter of, 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 of you know, how societies work in the sense that he says all societies need a civil religion, which is an agreed set of values. And in the United States, you know, that civil religion, even though there are distinctions between church and state, was broadly Protestant or arose out of Protestantism. In Ireland, it was Catholic even though there is also kind of a sense of difference between uh, church and state and so on and so forth. So you can have secular civil religions, but that's, that's, it's a bit like, it, it's just a term that's kind of, kind of used generally, but it doesn't necessarily mean that secularism is a religion in a sense, although it may share certain aspects and attributes in terms of how religion is organized and how ideas are mobilized. Uh, so I think it's, it, there is something quite different going on there. Uh, now I've lost I've lost sight of your question. I'm sorry to say. Sorry, no. I, I just actually on what you said about whether or not it is it is religion. I think it is the point that I think people on the conservative side started viewing it as a religion was largely in relation to uh, advancements in relation to transgenderism and talks of people having innate natures that can be contrary to their body because that's similar to what you saw with you okay. know, the Gnostics and the the mind body. But my my real question there is. People on the conservative side of things starting in the last while to view it as effectively a, conserv or a coercive religious movement. But what I would ask you, not, not whether or not you agree with that, but how do we tell when something has become coercive rather than just being blinded by our own ideology and seeing something that, that we don't like? Okay, take a step back for a second. I teach social policy, which is everything from the welfare state to you know, uh, kind of pensions, all these kinds of things. But I would argue to my students that social policy is inherently coercive, that all systems, all sorts of rules are coercive. If you stay in a hotel, you can only allow going to your room, you're not allowed going to the next guy's room. That's coercive. There are all manner of things that are coercive in this world. There are all manner of rules that we must abide by and follow. Uh, in relation to public morality, the aim of kind of, the idea of, of a coercive public morality is when you find yourself basically not in agreement with uh, 
with the with the moral ideas being, if you will, uh, inculcated or promoted through legislation as, as as default cultural ideas or settings. So in other words, basically, if I am not religious and my child is required to have religious instruction as part of their education, I could call that coercive. So you could flip that in a sense. You could flip that in a sense. So I think that in a sense, basically, it's, it, you may argue that it's coercive if it's mandatory. Well, you talked about conservative people and you kind of rolled it all into a ball. I could imagine many different perspectives within the vista you spoke about from people who are very religious to people who perhaps also in the American sense who were kind of quite libertarian uh, or indeed libertarian and religious at the same time, who, who basically pretty much take a broad definition of what is coercive. So these are all very, very loaded terms, but kind of my book is kind of moving it on to sort of narrower ground, which is really about the use of law to promote certain values and where, if you will, people from, from, from the different sorts of viewpoints, how they kind of regard that and think about that, understand that what they would argue about it. So if you're a liberal, uh, a conservative or a progressive trying to promote their preferred recipes for the good society too heavily through the law is coercive. If you're a libertarian, it is coercive. If you are somebody who shares those values, it is not coercive. If you are somebody who does not share, sorry, if you're somebody who shares those values, it's not coercive. If you're somebody who does not share those values, you may find it coercive. So in a sense, in a sense, basically, there is no idea of coercive to which we can appeal that basically says that's bad because it is coercive. Uh, we tend to do coercive things in society. We tend to have rules. You can't drink and drive anymore. You can't smoke in a public building. They're coercive things as well. But we agree to do those things. Uh, or we've passed laws that those things should be, you know, around those things. So, so in a sense, basically, there are a lot of things in society that are, are coercive. But, you know, but some people don't think of a lot of things that are coercive as necessarily coercive if they agree with them. Or they're broadly in sympathy with the reasons for those rules and so on and so forth. So what is coercion to one people is simply governing by yeah. consent to another. Yeah, I mean, that's, that is, that's probably it, or, or prob prob it's probably more like it anyway. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, your book touches on uh, a lot of topics. I mean, it's, it's exceptionally broad. I mean, the start of it is, uh, as I said, a long description of kind of Christian thought on this. I'd be curious about this, though. I've talked to other people, particularly Americans, uh, people like Rod Dreher, a couple of people like that, who feel that to the extent there are two sides or two views, that they have grown so far apart that neither side really understands the arguments of the other because they don't really understand the other or accept their views as legitimate at all. And they usually then expand that point to say that there can be no dialogue because there is no middle ground because of that. I'm curious, as someone who studies this and is deeply involved in it, what do you think um, of that idea that these ideas and some of these ideas at least have simply drifted too far apart and there can be no a legitimate, impactful dialogue on it. I think that there is, that there, there just isn't a place for agreement on a lot of things. So if you believe abortion is wrong, and and somebody else believes that it's it's basically you know entirely a subjective a woman's right to choose, you're not going to agree much on that. If you were from an ideological, if you're of an ideological debate, if you're coming at it from say philosophical stances, but if you're coming from the messy business of being a human being. You could probably see merit in basically both absolutes, but basically look at real human beings trying to trash things out in a very messy and complicated world. So in the real world, most of us are, are not Rod Dreyers. We're, we're, we're not people, if you will, saying that most of the churches have gone so liberal that we need to pull up the barricades. We need to retreat back into some form of monasticism. We need to withdraw from the world. We need to take our children out of the schools. We, we, we need to treat ourselves like the Christians persecuted by the Romans in early times. Uh, otherwise, we won't have a church going forward. So that's a viewpoint. It's held by some. And at the other end of the spectrum, you might say there are people who are who, who have very amplified sense of progressive ideas, maybe around gender and so on and so forth, that aren't shared by many people. The, there's a battle, perhaps, between the extremes of ideas, uh, but most people find themselves somewhere in the middle and, 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 and you know, in, in terms of a lot of these things. But certainly, certainly one of the things that did interest me about Rod Dreher's work and others like him, uh, kind of, if you will, the, the li Christ, people who are Christian thinkers who are living in an era where they see mostly secular ideas 
influencing things to the extent also they see secular ideas including ideas about gender and so on influencing churches and so on and so forth so their argument is if they want to keep their faith pure that they must withdraw from 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 that general world uh, and they somehow must try and protect their children their families their communities from the influence of those ideas so there is this kind of sense that and there's a very good book i cite in my own work by a guy called Crawford Gribbons, who was up in Queen's University, and he wrote a book about the withdrawal of religious communities from the mainstream in the United States, whether through the homeschooling movement or moving to certain parts of the Pacific Northwest, to have, kind of create these kinds of, if you were Christian communities that would somehow stand outside the societal mainstream. So, so in essence, you will find people who will try and withdraw from what they see as the values of society, but they're doing so because they believe that in essence, their view is such a minority one that they, that, 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 that they will be overwhelmed by the influence of these majoritarian ideas should they stay in mainstream society. So, so that's a particular vantage point and it's a particular kind of response to things that you'll find here and there. You might find it in the Irish case, for example, with the Burks family, you know, who, who have become kind of embroiled in certain cases and you know, about, if you will, kind of their, their kind of, if you will, rights uh, as, a, as a certain kind of very religious family, but nevertheless seem to express a version of religiosity that does not seem to be that of, if you will, mainstream, if, if we can call it that, or uh, kind of the mainline churches around them and so on. So, so kind of that's an option, I guess, for some people, but most people are trying to get by in the mainstream of society. Uh, and, and you're left with the choice all, always of, of trying to influence the system or exit from the system or being loyal to the system. Those seem to be the sort of three sort of options that are that are there for us in politics but but exiting the world isn't practical for most of us that's for sure uh, another 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 argument or answer to that puzzle is is basically to, to, to ensure that we preserve and keep a societal pluralism so for example if people do want religious education for their children whether they're muslim jewish or christian uh, they should be able to have that maybe and that should be protected over law. And a lot of the court cases I write about in the book are really about people trying to basically, if you will, uh, keep their autonomy in terms of their own working lives uh, while, while basically certain laws are saying, oh no, you must do this. So the sorts of cases that, for example, that have become quite well known, the legal cases, for example, about say, uh, deeply Christian bakers who are asked to bake a cake celebrating a gay marriage or something, are they legally, entitled not to bake that cake or are they basically breaking some law about about basically equal status for 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 lesbian and gay people or whatever so so kind of those are the sorts of conflicts that do play out and the rulings of these as we go back to what we were saying earlier about the homes thing the law around these things is actually quite complicated the cases are quite complex and nuanced we do have rights our rights do clash up against one another but the sort of cartoon version of the free speech versus tyranny that plays out sometimes on social media is poorly captures the complexity of what's going on. I know just in relation to that debate you were mentioning about free speech versus tyranny, it seems like a lot of people have become influenced by the American legal view of free speech when they, they talk about free speech. And they're really talking about the American constitutional amendment and the government rather than free speech as a broader philosophical position about how we should structure society and how we should interact with each other and a willingness to accept a certain amount of, of pluralism uh, and um, open debate in society. And it seems like there's an increasing amount of people who take the view that free speech is sacrosanct, but only insofar as the government should not interfere with it, but are in favour of you know, what would now be considered kind of cancel culture and you know having people fired if they say the wrong thing. And that I mean, from my possibly quite old fashioned view of free speech would seem absolutely contrary to, to what it should be. Except in the real world, all cultures are cancel cultures. All cultures are cancel cultures. You could be there writing a piece now for Rip.ie that might get you fired. You could write something that is so far away from the values of the org of which you published that they might say, Gary, we don't want your services anymore. I could, you know, in any, you could say something in front of friends that would say, no, I'm sorry, that's a deal breaker. So in essence, basically, we always have to, to mind our P's and Q's in dealing with other human beings uh, because we live in societies. We tend, strangely enough, to be most circumscribed not by people who hold very different ideas from us over at the other side of the battlefield, 
but often within the cliques and organizations we're in. If you're in the Communist Party, you know, of old, and you come up with some minor heresy about Leninism or Trotskyism or so on, you know, you are piled on by your colleagues. If you have some slightly uh, different view on some piece of religious doctrine than other members of your church, you may be censured or excommunicated for that. If you are writing for The Guardian and you have a certain view about, say, sex and gender, you may find you're no longer welcome as a columnist. If you express a certain view in your social circle, you might find yourself not as welcome as you thought you were, and so on and so forth. So in, in reality, people form groups and cliques. We tend to hang with people who share different views or we tend to be tribal. A lot of the organizations that have sought to leave are social change. And I write about a number of these in the book. I write about how there have been big swings and big battles for control of ideas within organization. For example, I write about in the book how in the in, in early 1970s, uh, feminism in the United States, the main feminist organization, restructured its way, itself in such a way as to exclude women who were, who, 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 who were not pro-choice. At the same time, the Baptist, the Southern Baptist Congregation, which is an amalgamation of some 50,000 churches, you know, what was pro-choice in the early 70s, mid 70s, but increasingly moved to have a very strong doctrinaire uh, pro-life position. Uh, so basically, these are battles within organizations. If you look at the Southern Baptist case study, you see that the theological colleges were purged of their liberal professors and theologians. And this has always happened in one way, shape or form within organizations. And you see the same thing happening within political parties. You see the same thing happening, perhaps even in sports clubs at times. Uh, you know, you, you, you basically have these battles for control. Sometimes they're battles about ideas. The reason they're often so upsetting is that the people who are fighting with each other are actually friends and near neighbors insofar as they share many of the same views, but the battle between small differences can be a crucial one in perhaps, you know, what, what emerges as the new doctrine of an organization. Certain people get expelled or hurt or kicked out or shunned or canceled. So all of those things happen. Now we get social media where basically you express an opinion or you've written something on, on, on Twitter 10 years ago and somebody finds it and decides you are to be cancelled. So, so kind of the idea that you could be cancelled on Twitter didn't exist 20 years ago. There was no Twitter. So, you know, once we're in, now we're on Twitter, we're in a sort of a different kind of space or on social media, we're in a different kind of space where people have access to uh, things we might have said that in a way that was never possible for most of human history. For example, this conversation has been video recorded. So clips of this could start popping up all over the place to the end of time or, you know, so and, 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 and somebody would pick up on a 30 second piece of this and run with it. And that's the nature of where we are at the moment. But these are new things, but they're also wrapped around very old things and very old trends. So cancel culture is nothing very new. It's just what human beings tend to do. So I kind of do start with that in the book. Uh, before talking about it in terms of law institutions and the main idea sets that are driving the particular conflicts we find ourselves having these days. Just on your point uh, regarding the breakage of feminists uh, with pro-life feminists, one of the more interesting sections of the book I thought was where you examine the changes we've seen in views of abortion amongst both feminists and amongst both you know, the Catholic Church and Protestant denominations. And I thought you quote Dworkin there on abortion, and she's, she's very negative of it, on the basis that men will use it to escape from their responsibility. And it's a statement that kind of echoes what you hear from some of the early suffragettes, uh, I think, where they were, they were negative about abortion because they thought men would, would again, would get women pregnant and then try and, and push for it. But, I mean, you mentioned the Southern Baptist congregation uh, becoming uh, more hard line on abortion. Of course, you had the Catholic Church movement, uh, away from the idea of quickening as, as medical technology improved. And it's good to, to be able to see that, you know, these were not static positions. There are similarities, but there's been movement as technology has changed, as society has changed. And I suppose the question I'd have there is, do you think, or do you see any particular direction these movements are going to involve in, in the future? Or do you think they're pretty set as they are now for the foreseeable future? Okay. Here's where maybe I upset your listeners or readers a bit, is um, <laughs> we're having some debates at the moment about, say, law around sex and gender, about free speech and things of all these sort of things. And we'll always be having certain debates on certain issues. And we're always trying to, um, if you will, try to come up with reasonable accommodations. I mean, 
that we're a democratic society. We are, in Ireland's case, five million people working together to try and make sense of the world and come up with ways of living alongside each other, which is an absolutely fabulous country for the most part. However, if we look at sort of some of the big trends within society, uh, kind of religiosity has declined. The centrality of religious ideas of what it is to be a human being have declined. Uh, people sometimes blame postmodern thinkers for what's happening. But that, those kinds of ways of thinking about what it is to be human, about the possibilities and what they would call the emancipatory possibilities of this, you know, are, are, are certainly ones that have been percolating for a few centuries now. But I, I, I wonder, is any, any, of, any sense of this going to go back into the box? You know, in, 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 in a sense, let's just say, for example, we now think in 2023 quite differently about sexuality and about gender than say, for example, our parents or grandparents or even ourselves did 20 years ago. So, so there clearly have been, if you will, changes in ways of thinking. Um, are those changes going to go back into the box? I, I, I don't think that they are really because the kind of sociologists who look uh, perhaps at this would say that the ideas we have are functional, that they somehow are, they serve the purposes we of the society we find ourselves in. So, for example, um, and I'm now going to be a little bit mischievous, uh, but not, but in, in quite a pessimistic kind of way. So we have, say, debates about euthanasia that we've never had before in the West, where we had them you know, kind of the early 20th century, perhaps in different kinds of ways and things. Um, why are we having them? Are we moving to a position where the population is going to live much longer, where people are not going to have family members around them who can afford to care for them? where we can no longer rely on a public health service to do this for much longer periods of time, where people can survive in ways they couldn't have survived before for longer periods, perhaps also in intense pain and suffering. So in a sense, certain ideas come to the fore because of a certain need. Um, family sizes have got smaller. Uh, population in the West has, it, it, it's not absolutely declining because of migration and other things, but family size has declined. The replacement rate in many countries has declined. So people are going to find, my children, you know, who are now young adults, are going to find themselves in a very different position 50 years from now than my parents uh, find themselves in uh, relatively recently at, at towards the end of their lives in terms of how things are structured. So in, in a sense, the ideas are, are forms of software that serve us. I mean, if you were, they materially serve us. So we end up with the kinds of ideas that are useful uh, or uh, functional in, in, in some way, shape or form. So if our society is moving in a certain direction, uh, highly individualized, um, moving away from physical labor, mostly urban, uh, mostly living in different types of communities than those of our parents or grandparents, I mean, so many people who, who've written about religion and religious decline in Ireland have emphasized, for example, the centrality of the family and of the village and rural society to the, the, the reproduction of the faith across generations. So Jeremiah Newman, a man I mentioned in the book, and, you know, and I, the, so as a sociologist, he wrote about rural decline in Ireland. And he argued that as people moved to the cities uh, and the old rural sort of connect, interconnections broke down, where people lived their lives broadly similarly to their neighbours. So you were born, lived and died in the sight of the same church steeple. You went to mass whether you wanted or not because everybody went to mass. So this idea of, of a resemblance in the culture, a solidarity of resemblance, as Durkheim would call it, that in a sense to be part of the community you had to go along with the community. So in a sense, as, as those communities become more fragmented, more urban, more individualised, that's one of the reasons, according to you know, sociologists, why religiosity drops. Uh, so there are things that have, if you will, change in our society that mean that, that certain things aren't going to come back in the way that they were. That doesn't mean there can't be religious revivals. Uh, for example, if you look at Ireland's immigrant population, for example, you'll find that, uh, that they are disproportionately religious and, and, and church going and, and basically have larger families in some cases and are, are living a style of life much closer perhaps to to Irish people of the past for the most part. So, so kind of in, in a sense, religion isn't going to die or go away, but societies are changing. And as societies change, people tend to lean into the kinds of value systems and philosophies that kind of make some kind of functional sense for them. And in the West, it's, it, it's, it's turning out to be rooted in a very individualized lifestyle uh, with ideas based on autonomy, with rethinking what we mean even by relationships in certain kinds of ways, away from very rule-bound familial type uh, 
traditional monogamy and all of those kinds of things. So, so kind of we do see changes. Will those things go back into the box? I don't think so. Will we keep tacking forward and back in terms of how to figure out how to live better as human beings? Yes, we will. Uh, we'll do so better if we're willing to listen to and have broad conversations about this in society rather than shutting people down. Uh, but nevertheless, basically, it's not going to go back into the box. Just as a final question, Brian, before, before we wrap up, obviously your book is, is really about conversations, societal conversations, um, and, and the knowledge you need to have them. And I just wonder where you would fall on this. If you look at someone like Peter Mayer, and, and particularly his book, Ruling the Void, where he talks about the hollowing out of political parties, the loss of membership, moving them from uh, effectively seeing themselves as legitimate due to public support as seen in membership, to seeing themselves as legitimate because they have you know, stakeholder engagement, stakeholder support, the support of NGOs or groups that say they are representative. And he puts forward, I think, a very pessimistic view of what will drive political debates and political decisions in the future. And I'm curious what your own view would be on that. Looking towards the future and looking towards the societal debates, do you think that they are going to be driven organically from the public, from the, the public discussing this, voting uh, as they will, and things of that nature? Or do you think the major drivers of these conversations are going to be uh, yeah, stakeholder groups? They're going to be NGOs interfacing directly with politicians, telling them what people want, uh, supported by um, basically debate in the media. Um, I mean, do you see this as, do you see debate becoming, I think, more focused solely amongst the elite, or do you think it will be a more inclusive, uh, rounder discussion? I beg you to show me a society that where the debates weren't mostly those of elites. Uh, you know, the great defender of free speech, John Stuart Mill, wasn't a fan of democracy for the poor or the ordinary workers or anything like that, and certainly not for women. Uh, so basically, the, you know, free speech and sharing ideas, yes, but perhaps in the drawing rooms and clubs of the West End of London or wherever. Uh, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't the idea that the, if you will, kind of, of mass society. Uh, certainly, we've moved, the world has moved online, and that has kind of huge consequences for us in all manner of ways. I think COVID has told us something about that. The idea that work has moved online. The idea, Gary, that you and I are, are basically having this conversation here rather than in a pub or in a radio studio, it's a sign of the times, you know? So in a sense, things have changed and there are certainly downsides of that. Uh, but certainly there would have been politicians in the past who, uh, and even to this day, can I say in Ireland, and one of the things, wonderful things about Ireland is I do think we have mostly some very good politicians who, you know, who come to your mother's funeral, who would know what's going on in the community, who would have a keen sense of what's going on, who would be competing very assiduously with other people for your attention and your vote on bread and butter and ordinary issues such as bus stops and drainage and school places and all the ordinary things. And politics at its best is about these ordinary things. Ideology is what we get when we go online. Ideology is what we get sometimes with media debates where people who hold very strong and very polarized positions get the most attention. I put, a, I put a thing up above my book, which kind of says that it's kind of complicated lads. On one side, you got these lads, you got these furs over here. I'm gonna get no shares. But if I go and have a real pop at, I don't know, your organization, for example, or somebody else, I'm going to get hundreds of likes. You know, so in essence, the, 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 the debate's designed to be polarized. But if I have to have a last word here, as I would say, is that ideology is a very poor steer for life. You know, ideologies are useful. They are interesting. But, you know, um, they are also very, very beguiling. And they are, by their very, very nature, abstracted from reality, as most people understand or know it. So, you know, an ideological point of view is an ideal way, it's an idealized way of thinking about things. It prioritizes the idea of the thing above the actualization of the thing. In other words, this was Plato's idea, wasn't it? That, that uh, you know, we're inside the cave, we see shadows on the wall, the real world is out there. But Plato's idea wasn't, Platonic realism wasn't that the, the cave wasn't real. It was, it was the world of ideas that was much more real than our world. The Christian version of it is that the life to come is more real than the life we have now. The Marxist version of it is that the, that the ideology is, is, is bigger than the people uh, and, and so on and so forth. So I wouldn't trust ideology too much, but ideology basically, you know, is going to continue to drive the, the sort of wide swathes of debate that we have on media. Uh, thankfully, in Ireland, we have, for the most part, politics that's concerned with bread and butter issues. Uh, rather than basically caught up with ideological issues. 
it would be kind of strange if our politics became entirely embroiled in the sort of sideshow of ideological uh, issues all the time. Uh, there are certainly important ideological debates, uh, certainly. I mean, the book addresses some of these, but in, in, in real life, basically, most of us are just trying to get by in the middle and try to make sense of the world and live in it as we find it. Professor Brian Fanning, thank you for coming on. Thank you, Gary.